Welcome to Salem Heights Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us. We love any chance we can connect and spend time together, even in this way. Hey, we know that this has been a rough week, right? And we want to be praying for each other, and we want to be praying for you. If you have a specific prayer request, please email us at prayer at salemheightschurch.org. We will join in prayer together. Also, we want to declare with David in Psalms 18 truth about who God is. He said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Let's worship him together.
my shepherd, I shall not walk. In green pastures, he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and leads me on for his name, for his great Surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house I will feel no 
pray together. And Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you love us and that you care about us and that you ask us to look to you in all things. God, we want to be those that would look to you because we know that that's where our strength comes from. We know that turmoil is around us. We really should be looking up in these days. And I pray that that's what we would do. We pray now as we look into your word that it would change us, that it would encourage us as it will, because we know that your word says it will not come back void. So we pray that you would help us now to hear from you. In Christ's precious name, amen. Well, good morning, Salem Heights, and welcome to church this morning. We're uh, in a season right now where it feels like the world is literally on fire, and it's our prayer this morning that uh, you are safe, uh, we know that some of our folks have been displaced. Uh, you're with other family members or with some other friends. We're praying that this morning you are well. And our, our hearts are concerned for you. As a staff, we've been praying for our church and for our community that not only you would be safe, but that we would find profitable ways to be able to enter in, in this season, enter into the problems uh, and be part of the answer. And so uh, during the course of this last week, We've had some of our own Salem Hiders that have joined those folks down at the fairgrounds, some that have been displaced to that location, but also others that have showed up there with uh, meals, uh, things that would be able to support those who've been displaced. Uh, we've had folks helping others move, uh, and also we even had our own church opened up. Uh, if there are folks that are displaced, we have opened our church up for them to be able to stay here. And uh, so it has been a troubling season, but also a season where we have an opportunity to act like family. We need each other right now more than ever. And if you feel that the Spirit of God is moving you to be involved, and we're asking you to get involved, uh, you can sign up and get updates on where you can help by going to serve at SalemHeightsChurch.org. Send them information that way. If you have specific ways in which you would like to help, you can call the church office and they will make sure that they connect you with other people any concerns that we have that come through here if we find people who can help with those concerns uh, we will connect you uh, but we want to be um, active helping those in our community and not just preaching the gospel but living it out uh, alongside our community that's hurting right now we're in a series called In the Desert But Not Deserted. And a couple weeks ago, we started in Hebrews chapter three. And this week, I wanna pause our continuation of that series. I just wanna be able to make one observation of the text that we started in, and then answer three questions. During the course of this last week, I've had many people ask me three specific questions, and I would like to tackle those this morning in the context of this series. We started in Hebrews chapter 3. I'm going to read this passage and then remind you of the conclusion uh, that we came to in week 1. But it says in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, as in the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked to anger with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my way, so I swore in my anger they would not enter my rest. Watch out, brothers and sisters, that there won't be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. When we first observed this passage, the question we had asked is, how do you handle the heat of the desert and the answer was you bring ice uh, as an acronym there. Ice, I, inspect your own heart. C, comfort others with the comfort you've received from Scripture. And E, elevate your view. We're going to keep answering those questions. How have you inspected your own heart? How are you comforting others? And how have you elevated your view every single week in this series? But this week, I'd like to make one observation from this passage and then answer three questions. Uh, 
And the observation I'd like to make is found there in uh, verse 7 and 8. It says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. And then also in verse 9, when your fathers tested me, they tried me and they saw my works for 40 years. Every single one of us has gone through a period of time where we said, I, I just wish I could hear the voice of God. Or we would say, man, if only I could see God's activity, if I could actually see him at work, if I could see him uh, on display in some um, magnificent way, then I would really uh, ha have a deep regard in my faith, or then I, that would transform the way that I act or the direction that I go. But I want you to recognize that hearing the voice of God and seeing his works was not always an exciting thing for those folks, but meant most often it was a fearful thing. Hearing the voice of God is rarely comfortable. In uh, Exodus chapter 20, we've just received the Ten Commandments. God has been speaking to Moses and he's coming back down to the people and they had set up a boundary at the bottom of Mount Sinai as Moses had gone up there was a cloud that enveloped that entire place and the sound of a trumpet and lightning and thunder that was there and Moses goes up into the cloud he receives the Ten Commandments as he comes back down it says this and all of the peoples witnessed the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains surrounded by smoke and when the people saw it they trembled and they stood at a distance and they said to Moses you speak to us and we will listen. But don't let God speak to us or we'll die. Moses responded to the people, don't be afraid for God has come to test you so that you will fear him and will not sin. And the people remained standing at a distance as Moses approached in total darkness where God was. And this is what the Lord told Moses, this is what you are to say to the Israelites, you have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. Do not make gods of silver that rival me. Do not make gods of gold for yourself. When God is speaking to the people, he says, don't harden your hearts as you did during the rebellion. Well, he said, this is a generation that actually heard my voice and my voice was loud, it was thunderous. In fact, when you heard my voice, it was so enthralling, so captivating, but so fearful. You trembled and said, Moses, you be the one to speak to us. Don't let us hear this voice this loudly. You were trembling, he said, before the voice of God. But then you walked right out of that meeting and into idolatry. You walked right out of that meeting and said, I don't want to keep hearing the voice of God. It makes me too fearful and went right back into idolatry. And God says, don't do what that generation did. They heard my voice. They saw my works. Elijah heard the voice of God. It said that he went up onto the mountain after his great victory that was followed by his great depression. He ends up in a cave and the earth was shaking and a fire goes by and the wind is so loud and it says that God was not in the wind or the fire or the shaking but the still small voice. But when God's voice came to him, Elijah was overwhelmed. Isaiah heard the voice of God in Isaiah chapter 6 it says that uh, there's a cloud that comes and the place is shaking and Isaiah is shaking with it. He says, O Lord, send me after God says, who will go for us? His voice comes to Isaiah and Isaiah is quaking. The Apostle Paul got knocked off his horse. He heard the voice of God and it was a fearful moment that led to a great change. The call in scripture, what God keeps asking us to do is when we hear his voice, when we have that moment where we hear him and we are humbled, he says, do not harden your hearts. Don't go the direction that your heart wants to go in idolatry and selfishness, but run to me. Hearing the voice of God is rarely comfortable, but there are three questions that come on the heels of this observation. People have been asking during the course of this week three important questions, and I think it would be valuable to consider them in light of what this passage is saying. And the first question I got this week, um, and it is uh, a scary one for many, and got it not just from our folks that attend church, but also from folks in the community 
who've been watching from the outside are familiar with Christianity, but now because of the times that we're in, because it feels like literally the world is on fire, they're asking questions like this. And the first one that we're going to tackle is, is this the end times? If we look around right now, everything bad is up. There is depression on the rise, drug and alcohol addiction on the rise, suicides that are on the rise, turbulence and politics and in our society, it's all on the rise. Misinformation is on the rise. To be able to get any decent trail of thought, of information, anything that can help us find our bearings has been lost. All the bad has gone up. And it actually says in Scripture, uh, by the mouth of, of Christ, that these things would happen. Christ said in Matthew 24, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they'll deceive many. And you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you are not alarmed, because things like these must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be uh, famines and earthquakes in various places. All these events are the beginning of labor pains. They will hand you over to be persecuted. They will kill you. You will be hated by nations because of my name. Then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Christ warned that the end times would look exactly as they look today. I remember reading a story by uh, Louis L'Amour, and a cowboy was trying to go to a rancher and find work. And he was with a group of other guys who were traveling to that rancher's place. And he asked them partway through their journey, hey, when are we going to finally get to his ranch? And one of the other cowboys looks at him and says, oh, we've been on his place for three days. They finally get to the man's dwelling, to his house, and are able to ask him for work. But that observation is an important one. People have asked, are we in the last days? What Christ indicated and what the apostles have told us is that the end times, the church age, is right now. We have been in the final days. In other words, the days that will lead to the return of Christ. The final stage of church history has been on us ever since Christ ascended into heaven. We have been on the property of the last days. But in this final season, I believe we've moved from the driveway to the front porch. We are right on the doorstep of the next stage. All of the things that you see around us are not just uh, turbulence, but it says here that they are labor pains. Labor pains, by definition, start farther apart and then get more rapid and rapid until you finally see the end arrive. The joy of a new member of your family being here. Well, the joy that we are to anticipate at the end of a painful journey is the return of Christ. But right now, these birth pains are on us. Every single indicator in the world around us is that these are the last days. I want you to notice, though, one phrase here. It says, because lawless will multiply, the love of many will grow cold. Lawlessness actually is not just in the world around us, but because lawlessness will actually even enter the camp of believers. When we begin to do what is right in our own eyes, when we begin to focus on what we think is right and we ignore what Scripture says, lawlessness has entered our heart, lawlessness has entered the camp, and says when lawlessness increases, the love of many will grow cold. In other words, people will just set down their faith and drift away. We are seeing just what Christ has described even now in churches across America. Every group around us says that they are a law unto themselves and even believers are starting to say, I'm gonna do what's right in my own eyes. 
the result is that we're seeing instead of a fervor of faith, we're seeing a dying of faith. It's an indication that we are on the front porch to the very last days. It's not hopeless. Christ actually says in that moment not to be alarmed. Uh, just as when we hear his voice, it may be a fearful thing, but the joy is we've heard the voice of God and we know the direction that we could go. Christ is calling us to a deeper walk and to have our eyes focused on him and not the storm that's around. He is here in the midst of it. Is this the end times? Folks, we've been in the end times. But for believers, this should lead to faith, not fear. Excitement. We will see Christ put all things together rather than see it all come to a wreck. He is near. But a second question that has come up in this season is, is God angry or punishing us? Is God angry in this season? There's an interesting passage that I would have you consider in Isaiah chapter 45. And here, once again, it's the Lord speaking, and he's talking to a generation who had lost their country. They've actually been taken into captivity in Babylon, and he's reminding them of what led them there and what will bring them back into the land. And he says this, I am the Lord. There is no other. There is no God but me. I will strengthen you. By the way, that's a promise every single time we hear from God in the season of calamity. I will strengthen you, though you do not know me, so that all may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is no one but me. I am the Lord. There is no other. Now hear this. I form light and create darkness. I make success and create disasters. I am the Lord who does these things. And the heavens will sprinkle from above and let the skies shower righteousness. Let the earth open up so that salvation will sprout and righteousness will spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Down to verse 12. I made the earth and created humans on it. It was my hand that stretched out the heavens and I commanded everything in them. I have stirred him up, speaking of the Messiah. I have stirred him up in righteousness and will level all the roads for him. He'll rebuild my city and set my exiles free. Not for a price or a bribe, says the Lord of armies. God is at work even in this season, but he actually says that he uses calamity to cause heaven to sprinkle righteousness. It's not that he is angry with us, but from time to time, God will shake the heavens to call us to himself. If we will not lift our view and elevate our thinking, if we will not look to him in seasons of comfort, then he will shake the heavens to get our eyes focused on him rather than on the world. Rather than being anchored here, he wants our hearts focused on him and in heaven. He says, do not harden your heart. People have asked, well, how can God even use suffering? It's actually a theme that's all the way through the scriptures. A short while ago, we covered eight different ways that God uses calamity. He uses pain and suffering. And if you want these, you can uh, get these from the church website. I'm just going to review them quickly. But God uses pain and suffering to change our direction. Hebrews 12 says, just like a good father will correct his children and bring them around. And sometimes that correction is painful. God does that in our life to bring us to right thinking. God uses pain and suffering to temper and to strengthen us. James 1 says that it actually creates endurance so that we can face harder things in the future and be useful. God uses pain and suffering to protect us from ourselves. If we're going the wrong direction, sometimes it takes a hard stop to get us from harming ourselves and others. God uses pain and suffering to cause us to look up. Acts 9, recording Paul, once again, who is on his journey doing his own thing, angry at the church, and he comes out the other side, an apostle of the church. God uses pain and suffering to lead us to repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 highlights how he actually brings us to a place where we've been running the wrong direction, and now we have a full 180 turnaround. We go the opposite direction because of suffering. God uses pain and suffering to draw us into community. If we continually separate ourselves, Scripture says he who separates himself seeks his own desire, and God uses pain and suffering to bring us back into community, to remind us that we need the family of God. We need each other, and don't we need each other 
even today. But God also uses pain and suffering to highlight our heavenly hope. Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 4 remind us that our eyes are supposed to be on heaven and that our hope comes from heaven, not from mankind. And God uses pain and suffering to prove our faith. It reminds us that we actually have a faith that can survive. An anchor is best tested in the middle of a storm, not on the shore. And in the middle of the storm, God shows us that the anchor that we have, our faith will hold and will keep us. He uses pain and suffering to highlight all of those things. A third question though that we get is this, and I've gotten it this week, isn't it cruel for God to use calamity? Isn't it cruel for God to allow things like this in order to call us? I want you to imagine for a moment that you're uh, at the beach. I was just uh, at the coast a short while ago before all of this erupted. And at the beach, you can find these smooth stones. In fact, many of them are taken from the beach, but now in order to keep up with the supply, you can actually buy these smooth stones at the beach. And the way that they make those stones smooth is by allowing them to bang into other stones. They put them in a rock tumbler. And the way you get rid of the edges, the way that you make it smooth, the way that they actually uh, can, can go from a rough uh, rock that is um, prickly in your hand to something that is smooth, something that is a joy to look at, is through tumbling it against other stones. Different levels of grip, but nonetheless, banging into other things. How do you get that smooth stone that is a beauty to look at, that is a joy uh, to hold? You have to get that by tumbling it. Faith that is forged in the fire of adversity is stronger than faith that is born in comfort. I want you to remember that we're not the only generation to experience testing. And the question some have asked is, well, in the midst of all this calamity, what good can come from our, for our children? I, I want you to consider during the period of 1912 to 1930, there were great calamities that were going on. In 1912, the Titanic sinks. In all of our industry to create the unsinkable ship, it gets announced, and as it launches out, there's great hope, but as it sank, so did our hopes. We were not as profound at building as we thought that we were. The Titanic sank, a pandemic entered into all of the world. World War I, called the Great War by that generation, uh, afflicted the world, it caught them off guard. It was their shocking awareness that the entire world could erupt at the same time. That was followed by the Great Depression, and in the United States, the Dust Bowl. Not only was there economic collapse, but our farms and the people in rural America that uh, generally could ride those moments out lost everything and were displaced and sent to the coasts. What happens to the children born in that season? Well, the children born during that season actually became known as the greatest generation. That was the generation. Those kids born during that season were the ones that saw us through World War II. They're called the greatest generation by many because they did not build any monuments to themselves, but they actually saw in their time uh, advances in science and industry and prosperity that have been unparalleled. That generation working and uh, with strength that came from their own experiences. Being raised in adversity made them strong. And that generation, uh, without complaint, faced the hardships in their generation and causes us to be thankful. Can God use adversity? Can anything good come out of this? Well, if God can do that in people, or if a generation can rise up because of adversity that can face future trials with strength, how much greater can God do that in you? He will use this season for your benefit if you'll allow him. His desire, he says, is when you hear his voice that you would not harden your heart but allow him to have his perfect way so that you not only will be encouraged but will be useful in this day. His desire is for us to be strengthened as a family in him, not broken. What would we need to ask each other? Three questions based on that ICE principle. The first one is this, in what way have you been tempted to harden your heart in this season? How have you, in the middle of this time, felt yourself beginning to harden or separate rather than grow and soften? 
Secondly, how or who will you help during this season? What is it that God is calling you to do? Not to look at others to fulfill, but what is he calling you to do? You have been fashioned, you've been placed in this season to help this generation through this moment. What are you going to do to join in what God is doing in this season? And finally, what would it look like for your eyes to be focused on Christ? In other words, what will others see? If you are focused on the Lord, what would that look like to the people around you? Consider these things. Salem Heights, we're being called to great things in this moment, but it is also a season of great hardship. We can't ignore that or candy coat it, but we can be a joy and a blessing in the midst of it. And I believe that God will give us great stories to rejoice in as we yield, as we listen to his voice, as we let him be God and follow what he says. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us in this season not to harden our hearts, not to drift away, not to separate and be uh, a, a law unto ourselves, but Father, help us to focus on you. Even if the world is shaking around us, Father, help us not to run away in fear, but to grow in our faith. We ask that you would use us in this season to be a blessing to those that are hurting, to reach out and be family to those that we walk through life with, to believers that are right next to us, to the household of faith first, but also to our community that is in desperate need. They need hope, and Father, the questions are coming. We ask that we would be able to give a reason for the hope that's in us to all of those that are hurting. Father, let us put you on display and proclaim your gospel, but also live it out as a generation that is growing strong in faith and listening to you. Help us, we ask in Jesus' name.